Hi, I'm Bill Patrick. The program you're about to see is part of a vintage series called Car and Track, which was originally produced during the first half of the 1970s. Before we begin the show, though, a brief program note. Using as many as eight cameras to shoot a single event, Car and Track captured some of the great NASCAR competitions of the era, one race at a time. Over the course of some 80 episodes through six seasons, series producer and host Bud Lindemann lovingly documented a unique era in American motor racing. While the race action contained in the series remains timeless, the program itself has not dated quite so gracefully. Although the years have not been overly kind to Bud's decidedly low-key introductions and interviews, we believe them to be an integral part of this one-of-a-kind series. So please, stay with us now as Speed Vision presents a rare slice of 1970s Americana, car and track. You know, when you put a show like this together every week, consciously or unconsciously, you start trying to second-guess the viewer, especially where races are concerned. You know, should we feature sports cars, drags, stockers, Indy cars? Well, today's speed potion happened on a road course. But instead of sports cars, they turned loose a horde of thundering late model stocks. And Southern California furnished the arena at Riverside International Raceway, a 500 mile kickoff to the NASCAR racing season. And we feel that this flat out fire and guts type racing is largely responsible for making the sport what it is today. Oh, and there's two showroom beauties in our road test department, a Dodge Charger and a Mercury Cyclone. We don't compare. We'll leave that to you in just one minute. You know, it looks like the Dodge boys have been burning the midnight oil over the drawing boards again. I think you'll have to admit that this is the prettiest one yet. But you know, it doesn't all end in the styling department either. You see, Dodge engineers have picked up a ton of know-how and garnered over a million miles of racing. And consequently, a definite improvement in the breed. In fact, our prediction is that this 1971 Dodge Charger will be seen in racetrack victory circles from coast to coast. first met the Charger, it was like pulling the handle for an instant jackpot. And our feelings have not changed since the first introduction. For our money, it's the best styling job to come out of Detroit for 71. When Dodge popped this one out of the hole, there was evidence that someone was doing more than copying the General Motors drawing boards. Of course, while you're dreaming about owning this one, the window sticker snaps you back to reality in a hurry. Ours had numbers on it that read a little over $5,000. With a 318-inch mill up front, our car was no Hamtramck hot rod. 30 miles an hour took 3.1 seconds. This engine was the standard offering in our tester, and as such, we thought it might be considered as a typical family investment. It ground out 45 miles an hour in six seconds flat. slapstick shifter controlled a very good torque flight automatic transmission in our charger and running through the gears was as simple as a Sunday school picnic. 10.3 seconds after we left the line we nailed 60 miles an hour. While running the pylon course we were glad we had the small engine. The same car with a 440 engine under the hood is not nearly as nimble through the cones. The weight ratio with a small engine is more near normal. We felt that body lean was excessive however it did not seem to affect the handling too much. Rebound and recovery were fair. For stoppers, our test car had 10.7 inch vented disc brakes up front with 11 by two and a half inch cast iron drums in the rear. From 30 miles an hour, it took 52 feet to come to a halt. After a half hour in the braking course, the pedal was spongy. The brakes were hot and our 50 mile an hour stop ate up 112 feet. In our 70 mile an hour panic stops, the brakes faded noticeably. Quite a bit of corrective steering was necessary to keep it in a straight line. 
And our driver felt the rear end would shake itself right out from under the car. This stop took 208 feet. Here's another panic stop, this time filmed in slow motion. The nose drops about three inches. The rear wheel hop is extremely evident. After this one, heat buildup was intense, and we had to let them cool down. This charger handled the reverse spin very well. With all the slack out of the suspension on one side, body lean was excessive. However, our driver felt that recovery was smooth and easy. In cornering, a little understeer is prevalent, but not nearly as bad as the 440 version. The front end stayed glued pretty well on this car, but with only 318 cubes, it lacked the power necessary to bring it through the turn in a drift. Up front, we had independent, unequal length control arms with torsion bars. In the rear, a rigid axle, semi-elliptic leaf springs, and an anti-sway bar. The dimensions have changed. The wheelbase has been reduced by two inches, the overall length by three, thus giving a more compact feeling. And yet the car is actually wider by two inches, thereby allowing more people room. Besides being pretty, this new Charger gives a much greater feeling of safety and security. Come to think of it, that just might be what cars are all about. In January, when most of the nation is under a blanket of snow, well, the hillsides of Southern California are basking in sunshine and balmy temperatures. And that's an almost necessary ingredient for racing. Every year at this time, Riverside International Raceway plays host to the Rebels of NASCAR. And it's here that the late model stock speedsters kicked off their 1971 season. And as per usual, they ran for a packed house. And with over $100,000 up for grabs, well, they were eager and ready. Richard Petty, driving his 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner, came up with the fastest time and started on the pole. Bobby Allison, piloting a Dodge, was alongside. Another Dodge, driven by a California independent, Ray Elder, was in the third spot. With Bobby Isaac's Dodge starting fourth, the head of this 40-car field looked like the Chrysler Proving Grounds. On the green flag, it was like an Indianapolis start, with Bobby Isaacs moving up alongside Petty and Allison for a three-abreast explosion out of the hole. Richard wins the drag and takes the lead, going into turn six. The traffic is heavy. The action starts early. Down the front chute, and at the end of the first lap, it's Petty, Isaacs, Elder, and Bobby Allison. They're wound up now and flying. Number seven, Jack McCoy pushes his Dodge Charger a little too hard through the turn and spins it out. But nobody touches him, and he goes back in the race. Here's Baldwin, the 07 Chevelle, looking for an easy way through the S's. Now Bobby Allison, who's been pacing himself back in third, makes a bid. Challenges Petty and takes the lead in turn nine with David Pearson, who started 16th, moving into the third spot. Pearson is hot today. He wants that lead and takes it in turn six. Another Chevelle finds the turn a little too tight and spins in the dirt. This one is driven by Bob Cox. Oh, that's all she wrote for the boy from Spartansburg, South Carolina. Davey Pearson just blew that Ford all over the racetrack. And he heads for the garage.
With Pearson out, the lead goes to Bobby Allison, but Petty is breathing right down his pipes. Out of turn six, Petty drives Allison hard, forcing him to the outside, and the Randleman rocket fires underneath. Richard Petty is back in the number one spot. There goes another one. Ron Grable in the Ford number five, just blue coming into turn six. With oil on the track from Grable's engine, they drop the yellow flag. This brings half the field into the pits. The action is frantic. On the restart, Ray Elder has the lead, but with Allison and Petty running second and third, he'll have to hustle. Petty is second now and closing on Elder fast, but through the ninth turn, Richard's Roadrunner pops a puff of smoke. He could be having some trouble. There goes Bobby Isaacs. Bobby spun that Dodge all the way around, but he keeps it out of trouble and may head for the pits for new rubber. Elder is still out in front, and it looks like Petty is having his problems. He's on the track, but running much slower. Watch it. Dick Brown in the Plymouth broke the suspension through turn nine, goes high, careens off the wall, and heads for the pits. Petty is also in, and with the hood up. It doesn't look good. All the top cars, including the leader, Ray Elder, in number 96, take this opportunity to pick up fuel and new rubber. Bobby Allison makes a beautiful 18-second pit stop and goes back on the track with the lead. There goes Elder. He'll have the second spot behind Allison. After a lengthy stop for suspension adjustment, Isaac drops his charger in low gear and winds out of the pits. And that's the end for Richard Petty. He dropped a valve, and with the engine blown, Maurice Petty and the crew pushed the Roadrunner behind the wall. Here's the leader, Bobby Allison, in the Dodge number 12. Ray Elder is running second, Betty Parsons third, and Bobby Isaacs fourth. On the 121st lap, Allison pits for fuel and left side tires. While he's on the jack, Elder is on the track and screams into the lead.
Right. Elder's Dodge is handling perfectly through every turn. It looks a little bit odd at this event to see anything but a Ford in the lead. But the Dodges and Plymouths have run wild today. James Hilton, one of the newer additions to the Ford stable, dives down pit row for fuel. As the race grinds toward the checkered flag, Ray Elder wheels into the pits. If everything goes according to plan, this will be his last scheduled pit stop. Elder's crew knows this track, and they're planning the race right down to the last mile. He goes back on the track second to Allison. Meanwhile, Bobby Allison's crew flash him the sign to take it easy and try and conserve gas and tires. If he can go all the way without another stop, he stands a good chance of taking the win. Elder is picking up the pace now. He's closing the gap on Allison's Dodge at the rate of about a half a second on every lap. Uh-oh. With only 10 laps to go, Bobby is forced to pit for fuel. And on the track, Ray Elder barrels out of turn nine onto the front chute, past the pits, and into the lead. This stop cost Allison 14 seconds, but with only a handful of laps to go in the race, it makes him a distant second. If Elder has enough fuel and can hold on to the lead, he'll be the first West Coast independent NASCAR driver to ever win this event. Elder's Dodge, number 96, looks and sounds stronger on every lap as he screams down the front chute for the white flag. One more round, and it's all his. With a satin smooth Hemi engine and a beautifully handling Dodge Charger, plus a 10 second lead over Bobby Allison, you can almost see the smile on Ray Elder's face as he pounds down the straightaway for the checkered flag. And with $20,000 waiting in Victory Lane, no wonder he was in such a hurry. You know, if a big luxury car is too much for you, but yet uh, you'd like a little more room than a pony car offers, the boys at Lincoln Mercury suggest this intermediate Cyclone GT. Our test car came with a standard 351 cubic inch V8 topped with a two-barrel carburetor. That's uh, a far cry from the racing version, but nonetheless, a fair performer. Ford Torino outsells this Mercury Cyclone by three to one. A glaring fact that for some time now has been a thorn in the Lincoln Mercury sales charts. They're quieter, give a better ride, and invariably offer more costly trim inside and out. But the buying public hasn't caught on to the bargain yet. 
RGT had the standard 351 cubic inch V8 topped with a two barrel carb. Off the line, this car had some pretty respectable time. We got to 30 miles an hour in 2.9 seconds. Our GT had the standard three-speed automatic transmission. This power combination probably won't win many free Hamburgs at the drive-in drags, but we still ran it up to 45 in 5.6 seconds. For the family that likes a little sportier than usual transportation, this is it. The G78 by 14 white sidewall tires are another standard offering. When we left the line for the third time, they bit hard, and our needle hit 60 in 9.2 seconds. The base retail on this Cyclone is $3,646. It costs the dealer $29.71. And for some number in between, you can own it. Plus accessories, of course. One item we would suggest is the cross-country ride package, consisting of heavy-duty front and rear shocks, heavy-duty springs, and a front stabilizer bar. Rebound and recovery were fair with the standard suspension. For brakes, our GT came with drums in the rear and power-assisted discs up front. From 30 miles an hour, it took 47 feet. As the brakes got hotter, the pedal got spongier, and our 50-mile-an-hour stop ate up 109 feet. After five 70-mile-an-hour panic stops, the brakes were hot enough to melt the fenders. Pedal fade was excessive. On this one, our driver stood on it. 212 feet later, the car came to a halt. In the cornering department, our test car was exciting, to say the least, mainly because we didn't know if it'd make it through the turn. With the front wheels cramped all the way to the lock and the nose almost to the ground, the rear wheels were pretty determined to drive us in a straight line. There wasn't enough power up front to kick the rear end out, and the front end was very soft. The heavy-duty suspension package is almost a must. As you can see, in the reverse spins, body lean was excessive and recovery a little rough. From a styling standpoint, it's there. But for our money, it needs quite a few performance options. And Mercury has them, enough to build yourself a great car. Well, it is, friends, our test of the standard Cyclone GT, 351 cubic inches, two-barrel carburetor. As we mentioned, a little on the docile side, but a fair performer. Now, in the weeks to come on Car & Track, for those of you that like your cars a little more violent, we'll do a 429 version. There's quite a difference. Well, that puts another one in the garage. I hope you can make this a regular stop each week. Our camera crews are busy capturing the top events in the nation. And you'll see them all right here on Car and Track, along with honest, factual road tests of the leading foreign and domestic cars conducted at our tracks with our own drivers to give you a straightforward appraisal of each vehicle. And plus, regular trips to Detroit for an inside look at things to come in safety, in styling, in performance. So, till next week, Drive carefully, won't you? All the pros do. And bye-bye.